Coming up on Network Africa. Kenya's Supreme Court begins hearing on poll petition by former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. Paralympic gold medalist Oscar Pistorius in court to try to force a parole hearing for him over the killing of his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. Plus, reducing future flooding risk in Lagos is the aim of the just-released Interconnected Disaster Risks Report. Let's get right into it. I'm Amarachi Ubani in Lagos. So we begin in Kenya, where lawyers of former Prime Minister Raila Odinga, who's challenging the results from this month's presidential election, alleges that there were systematic rigging in favor of former Vice President and now President-elect William Ruto, citing inconsistencies in the final tally. Odinga's lawyers made their submissions as the Supreme Court today began hearing of their request to nullify Mr. Ruto's victory, citing gross mismanagement of the election. They told the court that the transmission system for the results form was compromised by unauthorized access by known and unknown persons, insisting that this led to manipulation of vote information during the transmission between polling stations at the National Telling Center. They also argue that voters in Mr. Odinga's support bases were disenfranchised because of technology hitches on voting day and postponement of elections. Mr. Russo's rebuttal is also expected today. And in Ethiopia, the Tigrayan forces in the north are accused of the government of conducting drone strikes in the regional capital, Mekele. The UN says airstrikes continued last week in Mekele, killing a number of civilians, including children. One Tigrayan official tweeted that at least three bombs landed in the city hitting a hospital. One resident confirms there were indeed airstrikes in the city, but could not say exactly where they were targeted. A communication blackout also made it difficult to get details about what happened. In the meantime, fighting continues on the ground and is intensifying following a breakdown of a five-month truce. The UN is concerned about the number of people displaced by the fighting, especially in the Amhara and Afar regions. Ethiopian government, in its response, has accused the Tigrayan forces of expanding the renewed fighting to different fronts, including along the country's western borders with neighboring Sudan. The government of Abiy Ahmed has warned people against going close to what it calls military targets. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa says he will no longer tolerate the intimidation of foreigners in the country, whether or not they're there legally. He also insists the rule of law must be followed. The President was responding to questions on immigration from members of the National Assembly on Tuesday. He said if the issue of migration was handled properly, foreign nationals could contribute positively. He told MPs South Africa is not xenophobic and that South Africans have always welcomed people from various countries. Like any sovereign nation, Madam Speaker, we have the right to implement policies and measures that guarantee the integrity of our borders, that protect the rights of South Africans and provide that all who reside in our borders have a legal right to do so. To this end, there are ongoing joint operations by South African Police Service, our South African National Defense Force, the Department of Employment and Labor, and the Department of Transport to deal with illegal migration. Now, the first cohort of the Border Management Agency border officials has been deployed in areas where we know that there is often illegal entry into the country. We are dealing with the challenge of illegal migration. And we must remember that we are a democracy founded on the rule of law, acts of lawlessness, intimidation, and humiliation directed at foreign nationals, whether they are documented or undocumented, should not be tolerated. If migration is managed properly and occurs within the legal framework, those from other countries who are foreign nationals can contribute positively to our society as they could bring skills and resources to our economy and create jobs for South Africans. 
We have recently undertaken a comprehensive review of the policy framework for work visas to ensure that migration is managed in a way that benefits our country and supports our national interests. We need to work together to ensure that all the country's laws are enforced by the relevant authorities firmly and consistently. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa are staying in the country, though. Paralympic gold medalist Oscar Pistorius is back in court, trying to force authorities to hold a parole hearing for him after he was convicted of killing his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, on Valentine's Day in 2013. Pistorius shot Steenkamp dead when he fired four times through a locked toilet door. He says he mistook her for an intruder at his home in Pretoria. A major issue facing him now is when to begin his 13-year, five-month prison sentence, considered by many to be really lenient. Last year, the same court ruled that his current term should be backdated to October 2014, when he was initially sentenced to force them to hold his parole hearing. But the prison where he is being held, argues Pistorius, is only eligible for parole in March next year. It says the Court of Appeal has given contradictory rulings. However, the Department of Correctional Services says it's seeking clarification on the minimum detention period for Oscar Pistorius. In a different development, period poverty is a global issue that affects women and girls around the world, as many do not have access to menstrual hygiene products. According to UNESCO, one in ten schoolgirls in Africa misses school or even drops out from school for reasons related to periods. And in South Africa, 30% of girls who do not have access to sanitary products can miss up to 90 school days a year due to having monthly periods. In some countries, women and girls cannot afford sanitary pads. They put their health at risk by using things like paper towels, cow dung, and even leaves. A group of young protesters alongside Team Free Sanitary Pads marched from the seat of the South African government, the union buildings in Pretoria, to the offices of the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities to hand over the memorandum of demands and a petition with over 30,000 signatures. They want menstrual products to be free and accessible. A South Africa Bureau Chief, Betsy Dibia, reports. <laughs> This protest march didn't get as much media attention as they expected, but the protesters marched on with their message, calling for an end to period poverty and access to free menstrual products for women and girls. Menstrual rights are human rights. We're pleading yet again, after so many years, after six years of starting this conversation, that may every person who menstruates in South Africa be free to bleed. Young girls and women in South Africa need the menstrual health and hygiene bill now more than ever. So we're urging the South African government together with members of parliament to make the menstrual health and hygiene bill a reality by making menstrual rights a reality in South Africa. Thank you for bringing men and the boy child on board. That is a significant step. I hereby acknowledge receipt of your memorandum on behalf of the department in my capacity as the Acting Director General. And I also extend an invitation to yourself to be members of the Menstrual Health Coalition because this is where most of the issues can be addressed effectively. Buntu, a father of a 10-year-old girl, is among the handful of male protesters, and he says he's learned how important enlightenment on period issues is, especially for men. If we have to get that information, we have to get that knowledge, have that, to get that teaching from our women, you know, let, let's do that so that our kids, our, you know, offspring can benefit from it as men. You know, us being here, it is a matter of having learners whom, whom actually misses their days in school because of uh, something that they are saying that it's lacking. And then according to our understanding, it's not something that we are lacking, but then it's just the department doesn't want to open doors for our, actually, our young ones to, to have that freedom of education. Condoms are free while we have to buy sanitary towels. Apart from private efforts to reduce period poverty in many communities, the South African government hasn't exactly looked the other way, but corruption is always a challenge. 
what I understand is that um, the Department of Women and Children, uh, uh, young children and children living with, di with disabilities has a policy that says like in each and every school there must be sanitary towels and then tenders were given out to uh, distributors but until today we don't see pets in our schools. We have to uh, rely on donations and organizations don't have donations. Corruption is something that is consuming all sectors of governance and but we need to see what the cost of that is. There are lives at stake, there is education at stake, there is dignity at stake, and there is health at stake. And I think um, if we get uh, leaders and political leaders who actually care about the people, we might see the change we need. A country like Scotland is offering free period products already. Others provide to schoolgirls in some areas. The protesters here want more progress regarding the menstrual health and hygiene bill, a call to action that involves synergy among several relevant departments, including finance, women, health, water and sanitation, as well as environment. The protesters have given the Department for Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities 15 days to respond to their demands. Following the provision of vaccines against the Ebola virus, as approved by the World Health Organization, Ugandan authorities are vaccinating the country's soldiers stationed at the border with neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. A target is to vaccinate more than 10,000 members of the force. So far, only about 6,200 Ugandan soldiers have been vaccinated since the exercise began last week. According to Uganda's Army Director of Public Health, Dr. Francis Javier Bekena, response from the troops has been good because they are aware of the threat Ebola poses. A World Health Organization has provided 12,000 vaccines from Merck. An additional 10,000 from Johnson & Johnson will also be available in weeks. Frontline workers like health workers, customs and immigration officials will be vaccinated at the second phase of the exercise. Across the border, the DRC has confirmed a case of Ebola in the Beni district, North Kivu province. This was two weeks ago, six weeks after an outbreak was confirmed in Equator province. There have been no reported cases of Ebola since authorities stepped up surveillance and put 21 districts that border the DR Congo on high alert. The World Food Programme says that the first shipment of grain from Ukraine to Africa since the Russian invasion of Ukraine arrived in Djibouti and began unloading on Tuesday. A ship arrives after two weeks loaded with 23,000 tons of Ukrainian wheat. After being unloaded, the wheat will be transported to Ethiopia and is expected to feed some 1.53 million people for a month at least. The arrival of urgently needed grain came after Ukraine and Russia reached a deal with the United Nations and Turkey last month to open a corridor allowing for food shipments. The Global Food Agency estimates that about 22 million people are experiencing acute hunger in the North of Africa region comprising eight countries including Djibouti, Ethiopia and Somalia. The food on the Brave Commander will feed 1.5 million people for one month in Ethiopia. So this makes a very big impact for those people who currently have nothing and now WFP will be able to provide them with their basic needs. We've already seen a reduction of 15% in wheat prices globally since the Black Sea Initiative commenced. What we want to see is more food flowing we need, from WFP's perspective, millions of tons in this region. In Ethiopia alone, three quarters of everything that we used to distribute originated from Ukraine and Russia. Still ahead of the program. Learning about Ghana's history over a hundred years, and it's all thanks to one family that decided to establish a photo studio We'll have more in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching the World Network Africa right here on Channels Television. We're still in Northern Africa. A UN Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Rosemary DiCarlo, says she is deeply concerned that the ongoing stalemate and continued delays in implementing the electoral process pose a growing threat to security in and around Tripoli, the Libyan concerned. capital. 
and also to all Libyans. She was addressed in a session of the UN Security Council on Tuesday and in the threat materialized days ago when Libya became a theater of violence clashes between armed groups. I am deeply concerned that the ongoing stalemate and continued delays in implementing the electoral process pose a growing threat to security in and around Tripoli and potentially to all Libyans. That threat materialized a few days ago when Tripoli was again the theater of violent clashes between armed groups supporting Mr. Dabeba and Mr. Bashaga, respectively. This appeared to be an attempt of pro Bashaga forces to enter the capital from the east. However, they were blocked by pro Dabeba forces at Zlatan, about 160 kilometers east of Tripoli, and were forced to retreat following clashes. Attempts by other pro Bashaga armed groups to advance on the capital from the west and southwest were similarly repelled. More now on the situation with the Ebola vaccinations in Uganda, where the government is vaccinating soldiers at the border with neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. Joining me now is the VOA's Halima Atumani. She joins me from Kampala. Halima, thank you for joining us on the program today. Now, you think that the vaccinations will begin with the health workers. Why are soldiers being vaccinated first? Thank you for having me. One thing that we all need to know is that currently Uganda has a military operation in the DRC fighting against rebels. So see, considering Uganda does not have the virus, what the Ministry of Health, together wa working with the WHO, have decided they need to vaccinate the soldiers because, you know, soldiers keep moving. There's always change of, of battoons or uh, military units. So the best thing right now that the government has chosen to do is First, focus on the over 10,000 UPDF soldiers who are in BRC. And then eventually, I think that's when they'll come back to see if maybe they, they will start vaccinating health workers or who we call frontline workers out in, at the borders with DRC. Is this because um, the Ebola virus still poses a health threat to uh, the populations in Eastern Africa? It sure does. I think both Uganda and DRC have had history. I think uh, DRC in particular has, has, has had history since 1976 of, you know, Ebola outbreaks. They've had so far 14 Ebola outbreaks. And every time we have these Ebola outbreaks, they spread out to different countries, including Uganda, particularly, I should say, Uganda. So Uganda is always on high alert every time there's an Ebola outbreak in DRC. So what they do is that they always try and make sure that the border districts are always covered. There's intense surveillance in those areas. I remember the last outbreak we had, uh, not necessarily in Uganda, but in DRC, again at the borders. I was at the border with DRC and Uganda in 2019 of uh, June. And there we saw a number of activities. And this is all because if there's an outbreak in DRC, then Uganda has to make sure it tightens its borders, it tightens surveillance to make sure no cases cross over uh, into Uganda. Yeah. And, and I imagine that, you know, the vaccinations will, you know, transcend to people who live in the cities and who live in the towns. Uh, you just mentioned uh, uh, surveillance uh, putting up in tw 21 districts uh, across the border, at the border, uh, near the border with the DR Congo, across the border with the DR Congo. But in the country, within the country itself, and I mean within Uganda, are there other measures being deployed uh, to prevent another outbreak of Ebola? I, th I think the measures that Uganda normally takes in these instances, especially when there's no case reported in Uganda, is that they make sure they tighten, you know, the surveillance in, in DRC. But this also comes with its challenges. There's so many porous borders uh, between Uganda and DRC. So it's a bit uh, difficult to control. But the last time that I was there, you find that they would always put soldiers on so just in case along these, some of these porous borders, not all of them, of course. I don't think Uganda has the manpower to deploy soldiers all over. Uh, the porous borders with DRC. So at the main entrances where, you know, there's going to be main activities, business people crossing over. I mean, our borders, uh, people along our borders, almost brothers and, and families, just do, the difference is a little bit in the language. So there's always constant movement, children crossing from one country to another going to school, which also, by the way, we need to pay attention to because schools open in Uganda next week. 
And so you find that many of the children around the borders of DRC will come to go to school in Uganda. So there's going to be, you know, I know that Uganda has already set up machines, uh, Ebola detecting machines at the borders, business people cross, crossing into. Now, I think the one thing that we need to know is that the reason why the Ugandan, the Ministry of Health and the WHO in Uganda are targeting just 10,000 soldiers at the moment is because they only got 12,000 doses of what they call the MAC vaccine, which is pro which protects against the, uh, the, the type of, of Ebola, the, the strain that has broken out, which is called the Ebola Zaire. So WHO has only been able to provide um, 12,000 doses of the MAC vaccine. And so if, if the vaccines are available, if there's more that will be coming into the country, then obviously the Minister of Health will have to spread out the vaccination. So for now, it is mainly the critical people who are the soldiers who actually are in the RC, so they just bring them out, um, uh, vaccinate them and then take them back at the moment. Halima, thanks a lot for explaining this to us and we hope that you really do stay safe as you do your work. You're welcome, thank you. A picture, they say, is worth a thousand words. So imagine how many stories, thousands of pictures gathered over a hundred years could tell. Uh, you can find that out, especially if you're invested in Ghana's history and development over the years at the Dio Gritias Photo Studio in Accra. I'll leave that part of the storytelling to the Van der Puyju family descendants. A generation before the Gold Coast became Ghana, photographer J.K. Bruce Van der Puyju opened a small studio in the heart of the colony's capital, Accra. That decision would define his family's lives for a century to come and enshrine them as the de facto visual historians of a nation that had not yet been born. For a hundred years, three generations of Bruce van der Puyges have painstakingly amassed the world's largest collection of 20th century Ghanaian photographs under one roof. It's called the Dio Gratias Photo Studio, and its founders say it is the oldest in West Africa. From glass plates to digital files of nation shaping events or intimate personal portraits, the family's 50,000 image archive offers a unique glimpse into a crass transition from a colonial port into a bustling modern metropolis. Today, the archive is maintained by Kate Tamaklo, Bruce's granddaughter. We have, I'm sure, more than 50,000 pictures, you know, could even be more. We have a lot of glass plates as well. We have a lot of uh, negatives as well. And um, honestly, the story, the story they tell is about the history. Those days, the early days from when the slaves were taken out, we have the, the, the forts, we have pictures of the forts, we have pictures of the politicians, we have pictures of, um, um, traditions, all of that really. So there's so much to tell, even the buildings. Virtually unchanged since opening in 1922, the studio sits along a busy street in the heart of Jamestown, the capital's oldest district. The neighborhood has missed out on much of the development that has given Ghana its rising star reputation. But Dio Gratias stands testament to its past glory and hopeful future. If you have a phone and you just want to keep it on your phone, that's it, and it stays there. Which I think sometimes we, we lose a lot of photos through that. You know, those days, when a photograph is taken, it's printed, and then you have it. But right now, we have it all on our phone. When our phones are full, we delete them. And Today, the faces of families, musicians, politicians, and patrons adorn the walls in black and white including those of independence leader Kwame Nkrumah, Britain's Queen Elizabeth, and his graced American president, Richard Nixon. Tema Claude took over Dio Gratias when her father, Isaac, a lifelong photographer who inherited the studio from his father, began to lose his eyesight. What began as a mission to digitize the archive has since become a full-time job, one she hopes to pass on to the next generation when the time comes. 
incredible, isn't it? Now, addressing the uns unsustainable and illegal sand mining practices along Nigeria's shorelines to supply the construction boom is key for not only reducing future flooding risk in Lagos, but also preserve valuable food and water resources in times of scarcity in Taiwan. The authors of the Interconnected Disaster Risk Report uh, say that without urgent investments into scale-up of solutions, disasters we're currently selling seen around the globe will be the new normal and emphasizes both individual and collective responsibility to become part of the solution. In, as far as alternatives, yes, this is something we go into in the report. If we can find different materials to build with, this will re relieve the pressure of needing so much sand. So um, as we go into in the report, there's not just one solution for everything, but we need to find uh, a mix of good solutions and, and apply them together. And for each of the cases in the report, we give examples of what we call solution packages, where we, we bring solutions together uh, that can work in combination. In Lagos, and as with other cities around the world, things like what we call letting nature work. So instead of continually taking space away from nature and degrading nature for other purposes, we start to give that space back. We start to conserve ecosystems. We start to restore them so that we can uh, benefit from their ability to protect us from things like storm surge and flooding. This can go hand in hand with things like consuming sustainably. So we talked about sand mining, trying to find alternative materials, but also uh, things like I mentioned, the drainage system. Consuming sustainably means less garbage, being more aware of how to manage waste. And this is uh, something that um, hinders the drainage systems in Lagos, but even somewhere like New York that struggled recently during Hurricane Ida when they received more rain than the city could handle. Their aging sewer system also faces problems from people just throwing things, flushing things down the toilet and clogging things up. So um, it, it comes to the level of every person can contribute to some of these solutions. A lot we need to do to save our environment. Thanks for watching Network Africa. I'm Amarachi Ubani.